Hello and thank you for joining me everyone on this week's edition of the Sabbath School Commentary produced by the North New South Wales Conference Sabbath School Department. We are embarking upon a new journey together this quarter. We are studying the subject of education and lesson one in this quarter's lesson study is entitled Education in the Garden of Eden. Now, I want to read you a quote from Ellen White that the lesson shares with us to begin. She says, The system of education instituted at the beginning of the world was to be a model for men throughout all after time. As an illustration of its principles, a model school was established in Eden, the home of our first parents. The Garden of Eden was their schoolroom. Nature was the lesson book. The creator himself was the instructor and the parents of the human family were the students. Now, I don't know if you had ever thought of this before, but the Garden of Eden was a classroom. And I love that idea that Adam and Eve, our first parents, were the students and God himself was the teacher and his creation was the lesson book. Now, you can learn a bit about a painter from what they paint through their paintings. You can learn a little about an engineer through what they design. And you can learn from God or you can learn about the creator through what he has made. Uh, I think that's a really cool lesson because this teaches us that the knowledge of God, the wisdom of God is accessible to all of us through the natural world. And uh, we can go on about that, but that's just really, really cool. I want to point out something that the lesson does not discuss in this week's lesson that I find fascinating. Now, read with me Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, and we'll read a few verses in Genesis 1. Okay, follow this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. The Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw the light that was good, that it was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. So the earth is without form and void and darkness is upon the face of the deep. The spirit of God is there though, and he's moving upon the face of the waters. And in order to create light, God speaks light into existence. And he says, let there be light. And the Bible says there was light. And so then, and therefore God divides the light from the darkness in order to create the evening and the morning. And that is the first day, the evening and the morning. So God separates, God divides. You have in the first day of creation, God making a distinction between light and darkness. He puts these two distinct things together. He combines them together and creates the first day. So darkness and light work in a complementary relationship. So light is not dark. Dark is not light. Light is distinct and different from dark. And dark is different and distinct from light, but God takes them both, he combines them together, and then he makes the evening and the morning. And those two distinct things, light and darkness, become one thing. They combine together to complement, to create a 24 hour day. Now, verse, we're in verse six, it says, then God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters. He's creating the atmosphere and let us separate the waters from the waters. God made the expanse and separated the waters which were below the expanse from the waters which were above the expanse. 
and it was so. God called the expanse heaven, and there was evening, and there was morning. So, watery mass, darkness. God divides light from darkness, combines them together in a complementary way, and you have the first day. Then, God separates the water from the air. He creates the upper atmosphere, you have the sky, and then you have the water below the firmament, or the, below the expanse, the sky. So, God separates water and the atmosphere, the air. Uh, water is not air, air is not water. These are two distinct elements, two distinct things. But God separates, divides, and then you, so you have distinction, complementary distinction right there in the formation of our ecosystem, our environment, the earth, similar to the first day. Uh, this goes on where God then um, makes a distinction. Uh, he distinguishes between earth and, and water. So what you're seeing is a pattern. What we're seeing is a pattern as we read the creation week. God is make, taking the distinct elements, light, darkness. Yeah, those aren't elements, but those are things, things that are distinct and different. And he's making them complement one another together, then combining to create our world. Okay? I, I find this really cool, especially in the light of the times that we're living in today. We live in a world where people think that, well, we live in a world where differences don't tend to complement, they tend to contradict, and they tend to ensure that people do not work in harmony and do not function in harmony. But you see in the very creation account of our planet that God takes things that are distinct and different from one another and he combines them together to, to work in complementary fashion. This is telling us something about God and it's telling us something about ourselves. He creates a world that we are to inhabit that's composed of, of complementary parts that work together that are distinct and different. Um, hey, we're all distinct and different people. We have different personalities. We look different. We're different sizes, different shapes, different colors. And our differences don't have to divide us. Our differences can bring us together. We can work in, in a complementary fashion and we can make a beautiful world. Um, it's all the different parts of the planet that combine together to create the beautiful world that we live in. God created a symphony of distinction that all played a certain part and that combines together to make a beautiful song. It's the world that we inhabit. I hope this makes sense. There's better ways to say it, but I wanted to share this really cool point. It's a lesson from the creation to celebrate diversity, the distinction, the difference, and to allow it to function in complement, complementary fashion. Okay, so now in Genesis chapter 2, God creates humanity. And interestingly, he divides the race of humanity into two halves the male half and the female half, uh, two distinct halves of the human race. Um, so this follows the same pattern of creating complementary distinction that is supposed to combine together and work together to one end, to one purpose. Um, I've heard someone say before that love is the principle that makes and maintains ideal relationships. One of my teachers said that to me. Love is the principle that makes and maintains ideal relationships. And it's the law of God that defines those relationships. It's the natural laws that God institutes. They define the relationships that are ideal. And it's moral law, the moral law of God, that defines ideal relationships, that, 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 that maintains ideal relationships and that makes ideal relationships. And so... You see, um, these parts of the natural world that function unselfishly, they, they complement, they give, they serve one another. And, and so too we are to be. We're supposed to be the same. Okay, now let's read together uh, the last, uh, so, some verses uh, in Genesis chapter 2. And I want to just share insights, share some thoughts 
from Genesis 2 that could inspire you on this Sabbath in Sabbath school class. So verse uh, 7 is where we begin. So God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living being. The Lord God planted a garden towards the east in Eden and there he placed the man whom he had formed. So he forms Adam and he places Adam in a garden toward the east in Eden. And then it says that God out of the ground the Lord God caused to grow every tree that is pleasing to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, this teaches us, the creation here teaches us that God is a giver. He provides for the needs of, of humanity. And humanity really here in the Garden of Eden doesn't have to work to provide for itself. Everything is provided for by God. This is a lesson. I am your father. I will provide everything that you need. Um, this lesson is demonstrated here in this account. Here's the tree of life. You can live forever. Here's all of this sustenance. That just grows off of the, out of the trees. And there's this tree of the knowledge of good and evil that is a sign that I, I respect your free will. You're made in my image. I am a free moral being and therefore my children, my people must be free moral beings. Uh, being able to choose is a part of being made in the image of God. And to remove opportunity for choice from a person is to take away their humanity. It's to make them a machine. It's to make them an instinct-driven animal. And so God is a free moral being who has the power to choose. And therefore, he made human beings with the same capacity. And the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is an indication of that fact. You can choose. You can decide. You're not forced you have options. You have options to be with me or to be without me. Uh, God is teaching through the fact that he put the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the Garden of Eden. Now, the Bible talks about some rivers that flow in multiple different directions, watering the land that come out of the Garden of Eden. And then we jump down to verse uh, 15. It says, then the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and keep it. Whoa, wait a second. Mankind, or man in particular, uh, when he was made, was made a landscaper, a gardener. Guys, this is teaching so much. But one thing it teaches is that it's honorable to do physical labor and to work in the soil, to work with the, with, with the physical world, to work with your hands, to get dirty. Um, we oftentimes look down upon you know, uh, the common laborer, but uh, God made Adam a common, what we would call a common laborer. He was a landscaper. Okay, as I said at the beginning of this commentary, the, the, we all have access to God's wisdom, to God's attributes through the natural world. And so it was going to be in immersing himself in the natural world and tending the garden and working with the natural environment around him that Adam was going to be educated, right? Right? And so we, we can find the same. I wish that there were people who were builders, who were, you know, landscapers and, and who did, you know, blue collar type labor who would realize that, that uh, they have at their fingertips the wisdom and knowledge of God, even in the common trade. So God sanctifies work, physical labor, by making Adam a gardener. The Lord uh, commanded the man saying, 
from any tree of the garden you may freely eat, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day you eat from it, you will surely die. Okay, I want to share something with you that's powerful, okay? Now, God has finished his creation, okay, up to the point of making man. Okay, you've got a, you've got a garden. Uh, the world has basically been finished. And then God forms the man from the dust of the ground. Now, the woman is not yet in existence. And uh, he's going to make women, female, soon, but he hasn't done it yet. Uh, but the plan is, is there to make humanity in two distinct halves. He creates the first half, the male, and he pulls him out of the dirt, out of the dust of the ground, and then animates him with his breath of life. And then man is told, you are the gardener, you're the caretaker. You are responsible for the physical maintenance of and upkeep of this garden. Okay, And then he makes him the moral governor of the garden. He says, there's this tree in the midst of the garden. It's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You will not eat of it. You will not touch it. Uh, if you eat of it, you will surely die. God doesn't say you won't touch it. I'm borrowing from Genesis 3. But you will not eat from this. And if you eat from this, in dying, you will die. That's what the original translation, that's what the Hebrew says. In dying, you will die. You'll spiritually die, and the consequence will be physical death after that, okay? That's what God is saying explicitly to Adam. So, you've got the garden. You need someone to care for it. He creates a male, a man. And then he says to the man, you are the moral guardian. I'm giving you charge over this, uh, this tree. Don't eat of it. Don't touch it. So I'm making you morally responsible for the garden, in a sense. You could say that. There's probably better ways to say it, but... Okay, um, now, if you didn't know, men and women are different. There's some fundamental differences uh, between men and women. Let me give you a few physical, uh, a few examples of the physical differences between men and women. Men, on average, are taller than women. Men, on uh, average, are heavier than women. Uh, men have more red blood cells in their bodies, um, pound for pound, but be, and, and this allows for quicker muscle recovery after exertion. Men's bones are thicker. Men have more fast twitch muscles. And uh, men, proportionally speaking, carry more of their weight in their upper bodies. Men's arms are longer. Uh, there are more, more cones in the eyes of males than in females. Now, by the way, just in case there's some bluebird out there who's, who's trying to think by me saying men have more of this, more of that, more of that, that I'm trying to say men are somehow better. Uh, that's just silly. That's, that's not what I'm saying. I'm just making a point that males and females are physiologically different. Uh, we have some different parts. You know, we, we men have big giant Adam's apples and that's rare in women. We grow more hair on our face than women. In most cases, in overwhelming majority of cases, men have more hair on, them, on their faces than, than females uh, do. Women produce more estrogen than men. Men produce more testosterone than women. A women can carry uh, children inside of themselves. They have mammary glands that men do not have, that men do not possess. Women can feed offspring from their bodies. And if you lived in a natural setting where you didn't have formula in modern technology, uh, you women would be the source of food for children and uh, men couldn't be, period. So uh, women can feed offspring from their bodies. Men can't do that. Women can nurture life inside of themselves Women, men can't do that. Uh, men have different genitalia than females. It's the opposite. It's the, you couldn't come up with a more opposite body part than male and female genitalia, but those distinct uh, opposite parts, they couple together to make two physical creatures, two halves of the human race become one. Physically, 
one. They can actually fit together, okay? So you need, you need a gardener, okay? Isn't it interesting that God designs the male in such a way that he's going to be f- more physically capable to contend with the physical world? Not even to contend with it, but just to, to, to function as a, as a part of it. He's, he's, he's physiologically built a bit differently. Um, okay, and so God assigns him. You're the gardener. You're, you have responsibility over the physical creation that I made here. And, and then it says, it's not good that man should be alone. This is in verse 18. I will make him a helper suitable for him. And then the Bible describes that God makes beasts, all the beasts of the field and every bird of the sky and brings them to the man to see what he would call them. So the man begins to name the animals. Um, And then at the end of his naming the animals, the Bible says, but for Adam, there was not found a helper suitable for him. So you've got this issue now. You've got this challenge. God's got a caretaker for the ground. He's built him for that job, for that task. He's perfectly suited to the task of being the caretaker of the garden. And as a matter of fact, he was formed from the dust of the ground. But now you need a woman. Or sorry, not you don't need a woman. You, he, this man needs a companion. Someone comparable to him. Somebody who's suitable to relate to him on his level. None of the animals are on his level. None of the animals are his equal, right? Are, are his kind, if you will. And so the Bible says... So, so, so here's the thing. The male half of the human race at this time, or the man, the only human alive, lacks companionship. Lacks someone to... Re- he, he doesn't have anyone to relate to, to have a relationship with. Okay, so... God, you would then imagine, is going to create him someone who's really good and really well suited to being relational, being in relationships. God's going to create a relationship specialist, someone who doesn't need as many red blood cells, who's physiologically formed differently than the man to complement. Something distinct, someone, someone, someone who has something new to bring to the table, right? Um, something distinct, different, unequal as far as how it's formed and fashioned, but equal in its humanity, right? Equally human, equally made in the image of God. Yeah, equal, yes, but distinct. Man doesn't need another man. He needs, an, uh, he needs a woman. He doesn't know what a woman is yet, but that's what he needs. And so God says, it's, first, so just follow the pattern. It's not good for man to be alone. Okay, so why'd you make him alone? There's lots of lessons in that. He made him alone so that the man could figure out who he was and, and find his first allegiance in God. And so that God could, and it's lots to that, lots to that. You don't, you don't know what you need until you know who you are. And being alone helps Adam to know who he is and what he needs and creates a longing for that companionship so that he would appreciate it more when he gets it, when he receives it. Okay, so... God causes a deep sleep to fall upon the man and he slept and he takes from man one of his ribs and he closed up the flesh in its place and the Lord God fashions into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. Hey, we lacked something. It was a a person for you to have a relationship with, a a relational specialist. Well, I, I created a woman. I took her from your side. Isn't this interesting? So God takes the person who he's going to make the gardener or the caretaker of the garden. He pulls, he creates that person from the dirt, from the dust of the ground, from the garden. And now there's a lot, there's a need for a companion, a relationship specialist. And so that person is formed not from the ground, but from Adam's side, right near to his heart. Um, It's been said by Ellen White, and I think the text, this is implicated in the text, but Eve was not taken, it says, from man's head to show that she was above him or from his foot to show that she was below him. She was taken from his side to show that she was his equal. And so we should affirm the equality of male and female while at the same time not ignoring their distinction and their differences. We are equal, yet we are distinct, okay? Now, 
design infers purpose. I, I stand by this as a philosophical truth, as, a, as, a, as an axiomatic truth. It's just true. Design infers purpose, okay? Now, if you're living in a natural, primitive type of a setting, um, males and females are perfectly suited to complement each other and to thrive in the natural environment. When you have machines and electricity and all kinds of things, you can tinker around with the machinery and get away with it, but you couldn't in a natural setting. Males and females, uh, they're physiologically different, they're distinct, and they complement one another perfectly, perfectly. They can help each other, they can do the same things together, but there's always gonna be that level of distinction which is going to qualify women for certain responsibilities uh, it's going to better qualify women for certain responsibilities than men, than men and vice versa, okay? So if you're in a primitive setting and you're, you need to build a house or plow a field, uh, it's going to be best that you choose the males to do that. If you're in a primitive setting and you need someone to feed the children and tend to domestic responsibilities, well, that's going to probably be better for women uh, to, to do that, to do that. Um, I'm, I'm, because of the climate of the world that we live in, I'm, I'm walking on thin ice here. Uh, but, but this is just, I'm just pointing out the obvious, okay? Just pointing out the obvious. I'm not saying that men are consigned to certain roles and women are consigned to certain roles and then that's it. And that's a moral reality. I'm just simply saying that uh, God designed us uh, a particular way. And that design infers purpose. Um, women are going to be moms and men are going to be fathers. There you go. <laughs> Um, so more, that, more can be said about that, but we're not going to for the, for the sake of time. This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And then for this reason, the Bible says a man will leave his mother and father and cleave to his wife and the two will become one. The joining of Adam and Eve as one flesh was not a uniting. It was a reuniting. It was a reuniting of two that had previously been one. She was taken from man and now she's brought to man. And then she is my other half. She is what completes me. She's the opposite half of the image of God. And I will celebrate that distinction while at the same time I affirm her equality, her equal standing in God's eyes. She's the equal half of the image of God. She's equally human. She's equally valuable. And, uh, but yet she is Isha, the, the Hebrew says. She will be called Isha because she was taken from Ish, from man. We are different. We're distinct. And that's a good thing. That's a wonderful thing. It's a, it's a strange thing to me that we live in a world today where people talk about celebrating diversity while they're all campaigning to imagine that distinction between males and females it isn't real, isn't there. And so they become experts at ignoring the obvious while feigning to celebrate diversity and distinction, right? Like if you say, that's what, like I was saying, I was, I was, I'm like treading on thin ice here. Like just to simply say that m women are better mothers than men is like a crazy radical thing to say today when it's like, it's as obvious a truth as could possibly be observed in the world. So imagine a woman has, say, like, okay, you live in a world without contraception, which is the whole history of the human race until 50 years or until 70 years ago, okay? So if men and women are going to have sex, then men and women are going to have children and women are going to get pregnant. Okay, so let's just say the average woman gets pregnant nine times in her life and delivers five children. Let's just say hypothetically, that's the, the historical average. Okay. So that's five periods of gestation times nine months. Okay, so what's five times nine? 45. So for 45 months of a woman's life, she's going to physically nurture a developing child inside of herself. Now, in the course of human history, formula is a relatively modern invention and therefore women are going to have to breastfeed their children in order for children to survive. Therefore, women need to breastfeed children. They were designed to. And so let's just say that the average woman has five children throughout the course of human history. Okay, so how many 
years is that of breastfeeding. My wife has breastfed my kids on average for two and a half years. They say that in Israel, it was up to three, was kind of three to four. Sometimes, you know, a little bit older would be like the average time frame that, that primitive or people living in a natural setting would breastfeed their children. So five children, say three years breastfeeding each child. How many years of a woman's life is that that she's going to be breastfeeding? 15? Okay, so 15 years of the average woman's life in the course of human history is going to be spent breastfeeding, not the whole time, but needing to have to breastfeed children and being filled with a child inside of yourself for 45 months. Okay, guys, if this doesn't indicate that women are better nurturers and motherers than men, if that's not going to make women better nurturers, if that doesn't communicate that women are designed to be uh, specialists at nurturing, I, I mean, I guess, yeah, if that doesn't teach you that, if that doesn't communicate that to you, okay, sure. Uh, y I guess you, you believe anything uh, that you want and nothing that you can see. Anyways, yeah, so it's just, uh, it would be astounding to me that, that that wasn't clear and evident to you. So I'm spending a lot of time talking about this. I didn't necessarily mean to. Uh, you've got a man and a woman, they're extraordinarily happy. They're in a perfect environment and God has provided it all. They're distinct, yet they're equal. Um, man is made, I, I like, a friend of mine says that man was made the, the moral governor of the garden, the physical protector of the garden, and the woman was made to be the guardian of relational integrity. She's to complete the relational package. She, of course, can be a gardener too and work alongside of Adam, of course. But she is not ultimately made uh, the person responsible. God gives Adam charge over the garden prior to the creation of Eve. Now, I, 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 this is really powerful. This is really powerful because when Adam and Eve sin, and then God comes to Adam and Eve, although it's, it's evident from the texts that Eve takes the fruit and eats it first, that God first addresses Adam. He comes to Adam first. Well, why does God come straight to Adam after Adam, after Adam and Eve sin when Eve was the one to eat the fruit first? This is indicated because, because, uh, because Adam says, the woman who, who you get, when God says, hey, Adam, what, what, where are you? Well, I hid because I was naked. Well, who told you you were naked? Did you eat of the fruit of the tree that I told you not to eat of? And then Eve, this is in Genesis 3, or Adam says, uh, well, the woman that you gave me, she, she gave me the fruit and I did eat. Uh, he doesn't say the serpent gave it to me. He says the woman gave it to me, indicating that, that when the Bible says in Genesis 3, when, that the woman gave it to her husband with her and he ate, it just means he ate with her doesn't mean that he was with her there talking to the serpent when they fell. And uh, so why does God address Adam first when it was Eve who sinned first? It's because he had made him morally responsible for the care and protection of the garden. Uh, Eve was brought to Adam as a gift. She was his younger sister as much as she was his equal, his wife. And uh, he named her in, in the Hebrew mindset, like from the, from, the, from, the, from the mindset of Moses who's writing the book of Genesis, it, to, to name something is to take responsibility for it. It doesn't mean that you're the dictator of it. It doesn't mean that, that it doesn't have autonomy and free will. And it doesn't mean that it's, it's, that person's not your equal. It just means that you're taking responsibility for the care of that person. Um, a pastor takes responsibility for the members of their church, but that doesn't mean that the members of their church are not their equals. They're not their equal in position or in place, or they're not positioned similarly. They, they function differently in different roles. One takes responsibility for the other in one way, and one takes responsibility for the other in another way. But ultimate responsibility lay at the feet of Adam, and that's indicated by the fact that God comes to Adam, even though Eve sins first. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 22, Paul says, In Adam all die, but in Christ shall all be made alive. Why does he say in Adam all die when Eve ate first? Adam was responsible. So the fall happens. You've got the serpent in the garden. You've got... Uh, Eve interacting with the serpent. I'm just going to make a few commentary, Terry, a few comments on uh, Genesis chapter 3. 
And then we're going to end this because I just talked for a long time on Genesis 2. <laughs> I hope that was a blessing to you guys. So has God not said that you could eat of every tree of the fruit of the garden? This question is a targeted attack at Eve's confidence in God's goodness. God is depriving you of something. God is withholding something from you, isn't he? Has God not said you could eat of everything? Well, well yeah, we can eat of everything, but except. So the woman is forced to talk about what she's restricted from, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the devil tries to take her attention from all that God has given and place it on what God, the one thing God has restricted her from. This is interesting because the, the tactics of Satan are never uh, too different today. He'll get you to focus on what you don't have so that you'll forget all that you do have. And this happens to Eve. And uh, she says, yeah, God said that we shouldn't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We shouldn't even touch it. And Satan responds by saying, you will not surely die. You won't die. And God knows that in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be opened. You'll become more enlightened. And you will be as gods, knowing good and evil. So if you want to become like God, you need to disregard God. You should selfishly push God out of the way. You should selfishly disregard the one who's given you all of this. And you should take the one thing that he's not given you and just and deny him as your sovereign. And you will become like him, knowing good and evil. You will judge what's good and what's evil. And you don't need God to tell you what to do. You don't need his restraints, his guidelines, and the path to ascendancy and uh, God-likeness is the selfish disregard of your maker. This, uh, this, this, this teaches so much. It teaches that, it implies that God is selfish. You want to be like God? Disregard him. That implies that God would do the same to you. The path to enlightenment is disobedience. The, the devil says similar things today. You don't need God to determine for you what's right and what's wrong. You can be God. You will be as God. It's interesting because she was made in the image of God. And the devil attracts her to the idea of being as God. Well, she already was as God. It's just kind of a trick. It's a real, real mind bender here. You are made in the image of God. You're the child of God. And God would give you everything that was for your good. He's placed one restriction upon you. It's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's to allow you an opportunity to choose to stay loyal or to, to not. And uh, it's a voting booth, if you will. And it is a test of your loyalty to God. And so um, God wasn't withholding anything necessarily. There was no good in that tree that was... That was um, being withheld from Eve. It was just simply God was giving this command to, to give her an opportunity to just be loyal. It was, some people would say it was an arbitrary test. It was an apparently arbitrary test. And its arbitrary nature was the test itself. It was just, this is an opportunity for you to choose just to be loyal, just because you're going to be loyal. Just to believe in me because you're going to believe in me as a person and you're not going to uh, believe a lie about me. But that's up to you. Here you go. Don't eat of that tree. And so there's so much that to, is to be learned by the fall of mankind. Here, men and, men and women here in Genesis chapter 3, pr just prior to the fall, like the two are one. The two are one in unselfish love together. And they're naked and they're not ashamed. But then as soon as sin enters into the picture, there's a relational fall that happens where God comes to Adam and Adam basically disregards Eve and, and says, oh, you, I only ate because of her. You gave her to me and then I ate because of her. So it's her fault and it's your fault. 
And so he's like blaming God. He's blaming Eve. He's taking no responsibility. He's forsaking his manhood. The mark of a man is responsibility, taking responsibility. And he chooses not to be a man and take responsibility for the woman who God had given to him in the garden that God had given to him to tend and to keep. He failed, but he doesn't accept his failure. He doesn't accept responsibility. When Eve gave him the fruit, he took and he ate it. He he chose to eat. And Paul makes it clear in 1 Timothy 2 that, that he was not deceived. He knew what he was doing. And so he chose the creature, the gift over the giver, the creation over the creator, he chose Eve. And, 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 and he did that. He did that because he didn't believe in God, that God could provide for him something more if, if Eve were to lose her life or maybe that God would redeem Eve anyways. Uh, and some people think that Adam was loving Eve in following her into disobedience. Uh, he wasn't loving her. He was making a God out of her. He was worshiping her. He was he was, he was unwilling to let her go because of how good she made him feel. He was loving himself in following her into disobedience. Loving her would have meant not eating the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, interceding, interceding on her behalf to God and saying, God, you made me responsible. You gave me charge over the garden. She was my gift to be my equal, to be my other half, and and I failed you. Um, She did sin, but could you let me take responsibility for her? That would have been the loving, godly, Christ-like thing to do, but he failed in that. And so he worshiped the gift over the giver, and he disobeyed, He, 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 he disregarded the giver for the sake of hanging on to the gift. And then when God comes to ask him what's going on to hold him to account, He throws her under the bus. He forsakes his manhood. He gives up his manhood. And isn't it interesting that Jesus succeeds where Adam fails and takes responsibility for a sin that was not his, right? It's a pretty pretty amazing thought. And then Eve, you know, she blames the serpent. Uh, The serpent, at least her, her blaming was a little more decent than than Adam's because Adam knew what he was doing and she kind of didn't. The Bible says she was deceived and she was honest when she said to God, the the serpent who you put in the garden, he deceived me. But she does imply that it's God's fault too because, you know, you put him in the garden, God. So there's there's a relational rupturing here because of sin and man now becomes subject to death because of sin. And so God curses the ground for man's sake. And he, he creates an environment. He allows an environment to be created that is hostile to humanity, to hostile to human flourishing. And the struggle that mankind is going to have to endure now is going to work in mankind's favor. So the, the hostility of the natural world, it develops our character and makes us better. It's a healing remedy, as painful and as difficult as it is. Now, um, it, it, I wanted to just share with you just a simple thought that I don't have time to really expand upon, but I'll just, this is how I'll end this little commentary. And there's so much more in the lesson. And I, the, the lesson just should have, actually, I, I'm going to make a critique here on the Sabbath school lesson. It should have spent just all of its time in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 for a couple of weeks and then moved on. But, um, it's, I'm sure there was lots of good reasons to not do that. But here's the order of the fall. Adam is made first and Eve is made second. Eve is, Adam's pulled out of the ground and given care of the garden. Eve is pull, pulled out of Adam and becomes one flesh with him. Eve interacts with the enemy, with the fallen angel and chooses to follow him, to obey him, and then to encourage her husband to do the same. So the two had become one. They were equals and one made an independent decision to go off and be in, you know, to to choose the lie and to disbelieve, to choose to disbelieve in the word of God. And Adam chooses to worship her 
and to submit himself to her and to follow her in obedience away from God. And so he's disloyal to God. So that's, 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 a, that's the creation order. Adam follows Eve. Adam submits to Eve and follows her into sin and has to separate himself from God to do it. Disobeying God, disregarding God, and stabbing his maker in the back. That's the, that's the, that's the fall order. Now Jesus comes and he is the second Adam. He is the son of God. And the first person who ever exists on planet Earth who's called the son of God is Adam in Luke chapter 3. He has no earthly father and he's a son of God. He is the representative head of the human race. And in Job chapter 1, it says, There was a day when the sons of God presented themselves before the Lord and Satan appeared among them. Well, why did Satan appear among them? Because he took the position in his own, he took the dominion of, of the earth from Adam because who you yield yourselves servants to obey, that's whose servants you are. So God sets up Adam and Eve uh, as, the, as the representative heads of the earth, and in particular Adam, who's the son of God. And, uh, but, but Adam obeys Satan, and therefore Satan claims the title of son of God and shows up in heaven as, as one of the sons of God. So Adam was supposed to be the priest of the human race, but he's not. And so here comes Jesus to succeed where Adam fails. He's the second Adam. He's the second son of God to, to claim the dominion back on behalf of the human race and to recreate the human race through his death, burial, and resurrection and give the human race a pattern to follow through his perfect life. And as a priest of the human race, he can, he can intercede with the merits of his victorious life. And he can apply forgiveness and mercy through his death on Calvary. That's what he's doing in the sanctuary in heaven, is he's functioning as our representative head of our race. So Jesus succeeds where Adam fails. Well, who's going to succeed where Eve failed? Well, the church. The church is the bride of Christ. We are the body of Christ. In that, the two become one. Jesus is the head of the body, and the two become one. Adam said, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She, she, she shall be called Isha because she was taken out of Ish. She will be, will be called woman because she was taken from man. The two will become one. We will unite. And, uh, but they both fail. They both fall. And Jesus, he then re, he, he succeeds where Adam fails, and he reverses the order of the fall. So the husband of the church doesn't submit to the church and choose the people that he loves over loyalty to God. No, he takes responsibility for the sins of the world, his people, those who he would make his bride, and he dies for it. And then he resurrects for them and intercedes for them in heaven and calls them now to follow him wherever he goes follow him out of darkness, out of sin, out of Satan's grasp. And so we are to succeed where Eve failed. And where she failed was that she believed the lie and, and chose the lie over the word of God. And so the Bible says, when she saw that the tree was good for food, desirable to make one wise. Um, no, sorry. She said, when she saw that the food was pleasant to the eyes, desirable to make one wise and good for food, she took and she ate it. So she chose her senses, her ability to perceive over the word of God. That was her failing. And the people of God at the end of time, they succeed where Eve failed because they follow the lamb wherever he goes. And so, yeah, may God help us to that end. And may God bless you as you have a fantastic day uh, this coming Sabbath, and enjoy your Sabbath school quarterly lesson study. Take care. God bless you. It was good to hang out and chat to you. All the best. Bye.